Hi, everybody. March 20, 26, 2019. I'm going to be reading an article that is rather long. And I want to thank my subscriber for sending it along. And you will see what that article is in one moment. But I want to ask, have you seen this video? The most secret illegal prison in America. Guess who's in there? High impact flicks. And he posted it 10 days ago. I just, I just saw it today. It is, look, the evil that is taking place in our country, our secret prisons, Americans being put in prison, tortured, it's happening. We can't turn a blind eye to it. I'm going to play just a few minutes of this video. Hey guys, I'm going to do a little bit different video right now. I have two special guests. You're really going to want to know what they have to say. But before I introduce you to them, have you ever heard of a CMU? It's called a Communications Management Unit. It's like this special prison within a prison. And by way of introduction, let me play this video clip from this TED Talk. You just check out what this guy has to say. I began investigating the most secretive and experimental prison units in the United States for so-called second-tier terrorists. The government calls these units Communications Management Units, or CMUs. Prisoners and guards call them Little Guantanamo. They are islands unto themselves. But unlike Gitmo, they exist right here at home, floating within larger federal prisons. There are two CMUs. One was opened inside the prison in Terre Haute, Indiana, and the other is inside this prison in Marion, Illinois. Neither of them underwent the formal review process that is required by law when they were opened. Now, I'm going to play that last part again. Listen to what he has to say. Check this out. Neither of them underwent the formal review process that is required by law when they were opened. That means according to the Fed's own law, these two CMUs, or basically maximum, maximum security prisons, are in existence outside of their own codified laws. What that means is this is an illegal prison. One's in Terre Haute, Indiana, and one's in Marion, Illinois. Now, the reason I brought my two guests on is because there is a guy who, who, before he was put into one of these CMUs, championed the cause of individual liberties, and that's one of the reasons he's in one of these CMUs. Basically, it's a prison for political prisoners. It's, it's, a, it's a place for individuals who the government wants to shut up. So my guests are Jordan Page. Uh, Jordan's a musician. You're going you're gonna to hear more about that in the next video and Angela Clemens. Now, the guy that I'm talking about is this guy right here. His name is Schaefer Cox. And his name may sound familiar because about three weeks, four weeks ago, I did a video on him and showed you why he was in prison. But I, I kind of want to recap that right here by asking Angela. First of all, Angela, introduce yourself um, and, and tell us a little bit about why Schaefer Cox is in prison. What did he do to get there? Um, I'm Angela Clemens, and I run uh, Schaefer's Angels, um, a nonprofit to help uh, Schaefer Cox. And Schaefer Cox was, is an innocent man. He has never committed any crimes. He was um, put in the prison um, for speaking up against corruption, child trafficking, and drug trafficking. Um, he was, he's been in the CMU um, almost the entirety of the time, with the exception of six months. Um, in addition to the terrorists that you're talking about, he, um, they put what they call balancers in there. So they'll throw a few other people in there so that they don't get um, in too much trouble for holding just one religious group. Okay, so explain some of the conditions of this CMU because what this guy just said on this TED Talk, and this is a journalist who does a lot of investigative reporting on these kind of prisons. He called it a second-tier terrorist prison. And he said the prison guards call it Little Guantanamo. So how is Schaefer and the other prisoners, how are they treated by the prison guards in this prison? Um, well, we have 
numerous, numerous reports and lawsuits out uh, through Center of Constitutional Rights and other places um, of the tortures that um, go on there. The prison is run um, after Chinese thought reform. They have uh, been four-point shackled for days. They're not supposed to be four-point shackled to a bed where their hands are shackled and their feet are shackled. Um, they've abused that uh, torture. They have um, extreme sleep deprivation where they will go and wake them up every 30 minutes. They have been exposed to extreme temperature deviation where um, at times the floor is so hot that you can't even touch it with your feet. And other times the to it's so cold that the water in the toilet freezes. Um, they've been known to be chained in very awkward and humiliating positions for long periods of time. Um, okay, let, let me ask and, you, and then, let me just cut in real quick, Angela. What, what's the purpose yeah. of these prison guards treating these prisoners this way? I mean, are they trying to extract information? What, what's the reason for this torture? Well, um, I, I don't know of any, any good reason to torture another human being. Um, so I don't, I don't know exactly. <laughs> Maybe Jordan knows more <laughs> on that. I mean, they use this kind of tactics in Guantanamo Bay for many, many years. They would put prisoners in uh, humiliating stress positions for hours and hours and hours and play uh, like, like death metal music at deafening uh, volume to try to drive them insane. They would waterboard them. They would do extreme temperatures, uh, sleep deprivation. Uh, all, all these things are torture methods that were... Uh, sanctioned under the Bush administration and continued to be under the Obama administration. Um, so what, when Guantanamo was supposedly, when that program was supposedly shut down, which I'm not convinced that it was, uh, a lot of those prisoners were moved to these these uh, facilities. So so all the guys that, all the you know so-called ISIS terrorists and whatnot, ex Islamic extremists that were down in Guantanamo were moved to the, to the CMUs and it, it's just been business as usual, and unfortunately, uh, Schaefer is caught up in, in all of that. Um, motive, motives, I mean, they, they, there's, there's probably a bunch of BS motives that the state would, uh, would, would say, were, or, or, or they would deny that it was even happening. I mean, you see you know, people that get, remo that get taken out of the CMU get sent back because they, they spilled the beans, they told the truth. Um, Schaefer spilled the beans on, uh, on a murder that happened. Uh, back in November, uh, he, he leaked the information to his law team over the phone, and he was punished by being sent to their worst dungeon in the whole place underground and pitch black for over a month to the point where he forgot what a human face looked like. You know, like, there, it, it, it's, just, it's just abject cruelty, you know, Stan, uh, the, the Stanley Milgram experiments <laughs> dictate a lot of this stuff. Um, about human nature and and just just the the nature of of holding uh, holding a man prisoner and what what the psychology of that is uh, as angela said there's no good reason to torture a human being but they, they they may be trying to extract information or just wear them down um and 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 be able to have a greater degree of control um you know it, we're talking about the state and what the state will do so there isn't necessarily any rhyme or reason to it but I, I, I would say, you know, personally, I would say it's probably just pre it's just pretty malicious. Well, I and and guys, I want to I want to convey the seriousness of this because when I when it says right here on on uh, shafercox.com, or I'm sorry, freeshafer.com, and really go to that website. I'll leave all the links in the description below. When it says Schaefer Cox is a political prisoner, for some I don't know why. Maybe it's just me, but. I put in my mind like a like a white collar posh prison. This is the exact opposite of that. This is like Jordan was saying. This is like a dungeon where you have no idea from one moment to the next if you're going to be aroused out of a deep sleep because you've only been asleep for 30 minutes and they only let you sleep for 30 minutes a day. You don't know if you're going to be uh, put in solitary confinement in the dark dungeon or torture or whatever. This is not this is not a vacation house by any means. This is actually this is actually one of, if not the worst prisons that you can possibly put a human being in. And this is where this guy Schaefer Cox is. So Schaefer Cox is a political prisoner held in an illegal U.S. prison called a CMU located in Indiana. 
after Alaska dismissed the bogus charges, not, these charges were dismissed, guys, by throwing out the whole case against him, Schaefer was targeted by the U.S. government. Um, Angela, can you speak a little bit to that? I mean, how can the guy be dismissed on charges but then targeted by the U.S. government? What's, what's the rationale for that? What's, what's the charge? Um, well, the two long charges were um, solicitation and conspiracy. Um, and it was just, they're just a railroaded, trumped up, framed charges. The only way they were able to even get those charges was um, withholding exculpatory evidence, which is evidence that proves his innocence. Um, so they, they took him to federal court. They're out of jurisdiction. It was a state case. Um, and the state threw it out. And the federal government came in and took it, took it over. And, and it's really, they're holding him illegally for the last eight years. If you guys, if you guys have seen any video of Schaefer Cox, he reminds me of a young Ron Paul. The guy is totally uh, in line with the Constitution. He champions the cause of truth, freedom, and individual rights. And this guy is sitting there in prison after, after having championed the cause of individual rights for others, he's now sitting in a prison being punished for absolutely nothing. So my, ne my next question is, and I want to go back to the Schaefer Cox website. It says, in 2011, after a rigged trial, he was convicted and sent to one of the worst, uh, one of the world's most inhumane prisons. On, in August 2017, one of the main charges was dropped by the Ninth Circuit Court, but Schaefer still sits in prison. And I'm, I'm watching this TED Talk last night. And I'm thinking, because the guy in TED Talk named three or four prisoners, I can't remember, Schaefer Cox was not one of them, but he said one of the prisoners was in there because he was an animal rights activist. The guy spent some, some time in the CMU and then was released, but then six months later the feds knocked on his door and brought him back to the CMU because somewhere along the line in that six months he had written about his experience in the CMU. So this is something they don't even want you to talk about. And I was just thinking, one, last night when I was sitting on the couch watching this video, I was just thinking, what's to keep a, a knock from coming to my door and federal authorities putting me in a CMU? You know, you know how much I talk about the government and exposed government corruption, and we're going to talk about what, what Schaefer specifically exposed in a second. But if you, put, if you put a comment on one of my videos, underneath one of my videos, you could be the target to be sent to a CMU or some maximum security prison because okay I really wanted to get to what Brian just said any one of us can be the next Schaefer Cox sent to these prisons do you think that that's an exaggeration this is the condition, the state of our country today, and we need to face how incredibly evil has our country become. Because if we can't see clearly the extraordinary evil that is taking place, then there is no way possible to fight against what you can't see. Our country is no longer the country it was a couple of decades ago. And frankly, after 9-11-2001, everything became very obvious increasingly so. When during the Bush years, this country started debating torture, torture. And we were debating it in a rather cold, um, you know, uh, academic way. But Americans just went on about their business. So, you know, uh, I want to thank John Whitehead for this article for 
all of his articles, a constitutional attorney who has been very prolific in his writing about what is taking place in the United States. He, as well as so many of us saying, Americans, this is your country now. You better wake up. The making of a monster. We're all lab rats in the government secret experiments. This is a long article. I'm going to try to get through it. But you really need to listen and face what this country is. You know, I got this comment from someone underneath uh, U.S. frequency war in Venezuela. Koch brothers, Trump, Mnuchin, oil, oil, oil. Talking about the takeover of yet another country. So this comment came in. We are a great nation. We just have a very corrupt government that we need to figure out how to get out of power. And I responded with, What's great about us? The response was, there are a lot of really good people in the United States. Unfortunately, we are also a very brainwashed people. Folks are waking up more and more, though. And I responded with, you didn't answer my question. And the response I got was, don't you have some people in your life that you can look at that you know are good people? I think you can answer the question yourself if you think about it. And I wrote, why don't you answer my question? What, according to you, makes this nation a great nation? The response, sorry, but I don't have time. Hope you understand. I wrote, I don't accept your apology. The truth is, you can't answer because you can't come up with anything that supports your claim that our nation is great. The response, no, I just don't have time to engage in a discussion. But I see great Americans around me all the time. Bradley Manning, uh, Martin Luther King, Crazy Horse, pretty great. Let me see if I can think of some more things you might agree with. How about the Constitution? That is pretty great in my book. The Bill of Rights, pretty great. Surgeons who can save your ass, pretty great. Washing machines, pretty great. This communication device, the computer, pretty great. Now I have to get busy doing other things. I am sure you can think of some pretty great things about the United States if you put your mind to it. One thing that I can think is pretty great about the United States is the right to be left alone. So take a hint. Have a nice day. All right, I get rather frustrated when I get comments and I ask very specific questions and people don't answer them. Uh, the washing machine, the Constitution that's dead, the Bill of Rights that no longer exists for us except for the words on a piece of paper. Um, oh yeah, Martin Luther King, Crazy Horse. Yeah, they were great. Uh, you want to talk about a great nation? You can't talk about the United States then. Sorry. We need to face the fact that we have listened to how great we are, how exceptional we are, that we are morally superior. Oh, we provide humanitarian aid to all people all over the world. We're so caring and compassionate. And we're little children living life outside of reality, enjoying the delusion that we maintain despite all the evidence to the contrary. It's, you know, 
now what is taking place in this country? Um, what the majority of Americans are revealing is uh, great mental illness. The U.S. government, in its pursuit of so-called monsters, has itself become a monster. This is not a new development, nor is it a revelation. This is a government that has, in recent decades, unleashed untold horrors upon the world, including its own citizenry, in the name of global conquest. The acquisition of great wealth scientific experimentation, and technological advances, all packaged in the guise of the greater good. Mind you, there is no greater good when the government is involved. There is only greater greed for money and power. Unfortunately, the public has become so easily distracted by the political spectacle coming out of Washington, D.C., that they are altogether oblivious to the grisly experiments, barbaric behavior, and inhumane conditions that have become synonymous with the U.S. government. I thank those who can see clearly. So thank you, John. These horrors are meted out against humans and animals alike. It's heartbreaking enough when you hear about police shooting family dogs that pose no threat, beloved pets that are guilty of little more than barking, wagging a tail, racing towards them, and greeting at an alarming rate somewhere in the vicinity of 500 a day. What I am about to share goes beyond heartbreaking to horrifying. For instance, did you know that the U.S. government has been buying hundreds of dogs and cats from Asian meat markets as part of a gruesome experiment into foodborne illnesses? The cannibalistic experiments involving killing cats and dogs purchased from Colombia, Brazil, Vietnam, China, Ethiopia, and then feeding the dead remains to laboratory kittens bred in government laboratories for the express purpose of being infected with a disease and then killed. It gets more gruesome. The Department of Veteran Affairs has been removing parts of dogs' brains to see how it affects their breathing, applying electrodes to dogs' spinal cords before and after severing them to see how it impacts their cough reflexes and implementing pacemakers to dogs' hearts and then inducing them to have heart attacks before draining their blood. All of the laboratory dogs are killed during the course of these experiments. I have lost patience with all of you who perhaps it's because you refuse to face your own contribution to this evil nightmare that we are living because we have all contributed. But those who get so angry, it is not we, Carol, the American people are good people. It's government. Who is in government? People. Americans. Who works for the Veteran Affairs? People. Americans. Who are the police killing dogs? People. Americans. Who are those taking part in these experiments? People. Americans. We the people. 
have also become the police state's guinea pigs to be caged, branded, experimented upon without our knowledge or consent and then conveniently discarded and left to suffer from the after effects. Back in 2017, FEMA inadvertently exposed nearly 10,000 firefighters, paramedics, and other responders to a deadly form of ricin during simulated bioterrorism response sessions. In 2015, it was discovered that an army lab had been mistakenly shipping deadly anthrax to labs and defense contractors for a decade. While these particular incidents have been dismissed as accidents, you don't have to dig very deep or go very back in the nation's history to uncover numerous cases in which the government deliberately conducted secret experiments on an unsuspecting populace citizens and non-citizens alike, making healthy people sick by spraying them with chemicals, injecting them with infectious diseases, and exposing them to airborne toxins. At the time, the government reasoned that it was legitimate to experiment on people who did not have full rights in society, such as prisoners, mental patients, and poor blacks. In Alabama, 600 black men with syphilis were allowed to suffer without proper medical treatment in order to study the natural progression of untreated syphilis. In California, older prisoners had testicles from livestock and from recently executed convicts implanted in them to test their virility. In Connecticut, mental patients were injected with hepatitis. In Maryland, sleeping prisoners had a pandemic flu virus sprayed upon up their noses. In Georgia, two dozen volunteering prison inmates had gonorrhea bacteria pumped directly into their urinary tracts through the penis. In Michigan, male pa uh, patients at an insane asylum were exposed to the flu after first being injected with an experimental flu vaccine. In Minnesota, 11 public service employee volunteers were injected with malaria, then starved for five days. In New York, dying patients had cancer cells introduced into their system. In Ohio, over 100 inmates were injected with live cancer cells. Also in New York, prisoners at a reformatory prison were also split into two groups to determine how a deadly stomach virus was spread. The first group was made to swallow an unfiltered stool um, Suspension, sorry. While the second group merely breathed in germs sprayed into the air. In Staten Island, children with mental retardation were given hepatitis orally and by injection to see if they could be cured. The Associated Press reports the late 1940s and 1950s saw a huge growth in the U.S. pharmaceutical and healthcare industries accompanied by a boom in prison experiments funded by both the government and corporations. By the 1960s, at least half the states allowed prisoners to be used as medical guinea pigs because they were cheaper than chimpanzees. The blue is the hyperlinks to more information. Some of these studies, mostly from the 1940s to the 1960s, apparently were never covered by news media. Others were reported at the time, but the focus was on the promise of enduring new cures while glossing over how test subjects were treated. Media blackouts, 
propaganda, spin, sound familiar? How many government incursions into our freedoms have been blacked out, buried under entertainment news headlines, or spun in such a way as to suggest that anyone voicing a word of caution is paranoid or conspiratorial? Unfortunately, these incidents are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the atrocities the government has inflicted on an unsuspecting populace in the name of secret experimentation. For instance, there was the U.S. military secret race-based testing of mustard gas on more than 60,000 enlist enlisted men. World War II experiments with mustard gas were done in secret and weren't recorded on the subject's official military records. Most do not have proof of what they went through. They received no follow-up health care or monitoring of any kind, and they were sworn to secrecy about the tests under threat of dishonorable discharge and military prison time, leaving some unable to receive adequate medical treatment for their injuries because they couldn't tell doctors what happened to them and look at how we treat veterans. An ongoing disgrace. Ah, but Trump can ask for nearly one trillion for our military industrial complex. And Americans, where are they? Caring, compassionate, I support our troops. Buy a magnet for a dollar, slap it on your car. That's the extent of it. Am I talking about every American? No. I am talking about the huge majority. CIA's MKUltra program, in which hundreds of unsuspecting American civilians and military personnel were dosed with LSD, some having the hallucinogenic drug slipped into their drinks at the beach, in city bars, at restaurants, before the documentation and other facts of the program were made public, those who talked of it were frequently dismissed as being psychotic. Now, one might argue that this is all ancient history and that the government today is different from the government of yesteryear. Really? Is it ancient history? The 60s? The 40s? The 50s? Is that ancient history? No, it's not. And we know I've posted videos. Others have posted videos. Our government has been involved in experimentation right up to this very day. Just look up. What are they spraying? Has the government become any more humane, any more respectful of the rights of the citizenry? Has it become any more transparent or willing to abide by the rule of law? Has it become any more truthful about its activities? Has it become any more cognizant of its appointed role as a guardian of our rights? Or has the government simply hunkered down and hidden its nefarious acts and dastardly experiments under layers of secrecy, legalism, and obfu obfuscation? Has it not become wilder, wilier, more slippery, more difficult to pin down? Having mastered the Orwellian art of doublespeak and followed the Huxleyan blueprint for distraction and diversion, are we not dealing with a government that is simply craftier and more conniving than it used to be? I don't feel it is. I feel, certainly with the internet, we have so much information on how evil our government has always been, still is to the present day. We just have a lot of Americans who don't care to look. So, this question 
Don't you have some people in your life that you can look at that you know are good people? No. No. I don't consider myself good. It takes a lot of work to get to be good. And all of this evil has been spread because we've got an awful lot of those good people sitting around doing nothing. That is not the definition of good. The definition of good, one is taking action. One is compelled to take action when they see injustice anywhere. They can't not. They have a force within themselves that compels them to stand up, speak out, because they care about something bigger than their own self. And because they understand that, yeah, Martin Luther King, an injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. That's a paraphrase, and it might be even not be a correct paraphrase, but you know what I'm talking about. We don't have a lot of good people in this country. And that is something that every individual has to face. Does it mean you're evil and bad? No. No. But we do live a delusion that we're good and decent and I'm nice and I don't I don't um, cause any problem for anybody and I'm out there you know in my community trying to help people who are in need and but so much of it is ego driven and yes we've got to get beyond the ego What does that entail? It entails facing the truth about your own self, the truth about how you're living, the truth of that disconnect between what you think and say about yourself and what you do. Your care what you care about is easily observable. All you have to do is look at how someone lives and you will see the disconnect between what they say they value, what they talk about. Oh, those principles that they think they live, watch how they live, and you will see that there is a wide gap. And that gap needs to be closed. But no, Americans think that they're just swell and they don't do the work. They don't look at their own self. They don't spend any time self-reflecting, evaluating, re-evaluating the beliefs that they have, analyzing their own self, their own behaviors, understanding how and why they behave as they do. So they don't know who they are. So they talk a good game, and they live a pretense. That is the majority of Americans. That's not good. After revelations about the government's experiments spanning the 20th century spawned outrage, the government began looking for human guinea pigs in other countries where clinical trials could be done more cheaply 
and with fewer rules. Guatemala. Prisoners and patients at a mental hospital were infected with syphilis, apparently to test whether penicillin could prevent some sexually transmitted diseases. In Uganda, U.S.-funded doctors failed to give the AIDS drug, AZT, to all the HIV-infected pregnant women in a study, even though it would have protected their, new, their newborns. Nigeria, children with meningitis were used to test an antibiotic named Trovin. Eleven children died, and many others were left disabled. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Case in point, back in 2016, it was announced that scientists working for the Department of Homeland Security would begin releasing various gases and particles on crowded subway platforms as part of an experiment aimed at testing bioterror airflow in New York subways. The government insisted that the gases released into the subways by the Department of Homeland Security were non-toxic and did not pose a health risk. It's in our best interest, they said, to understand how quickly a chemical or biological terrorist attack might spread. And look at how cool the technology is, said the government cheerleaders. That scientists can use something called uh, DNA tracks to track the movement of microscopic substances in air and food. Imagine the kinds of surveillance that could be carried out by the government using trackable airborne microscopic substances you breathe in or ingest. And aren't we ingesting and breathing in trackable microscopic substances, those sensors? Nanotechnology, it's great. Mind you, this is the same government that in 1949 sprayed bacteria into the Pentagon's air handling system, then the world's largest office building. In 1950, special ops forces sprayed bacteria from Navy ships off the coast of Norfolk, Norfolk ooh, and San Francisco, exposing all of the city's 800,000 residents. 1953, government operatives staged mock anthrax attacks on St. Louis, Minneapolis, and Winnipeg using generators placed on top of cars. Local governments were reportedly told that invisible smoke screens were being deployed to mask the city on enemy radar. Later experiments covered territory as wide-ranging as Ohio to Texas and Michigan to Kansas. Think about how sick our population is today. 1965, the government's experiments in bioterror took aim at Washington's National Airport, followed by a 1966 experiment in which Army scientists exposed a million subway New York City passengers to airborne bacteria that caused food poisoning. And this is the same government that has taken every bit of technology sold to us as being in our best interests, GPS devices, surveillance, non-lethal weapons, etc., and used it against us to track, control, and trap us. So no, I don't think the government's ethics have changed much over the years. It's just taken its nefarious programs undercover. They're not so undercover. And that is what I'm pointing out. Americans, even those who see, who know, there's a lack of care. We just go on. No matter how how incomprehensibly evil our government becomes. We just go on about our business.
Nothing's tragic. Have we become so desensitized that we have lost our care and compassion? Why is the government doing this? The answer is always the same. Money, power, and total domination. It's the same answer no matter which totalitarian regime is in power. We don't live in a democracy. We are not free. We live in a totalitarian police state. All of us tracked all data collected and stored with Americans being thrown in illegal secret prisons and tortured. Americans tortured by their own. Yeah. The mindset driving these programs has appropriately been likened to that of Nazi doctors experimenting on Jews. The Nazis' unethical experiments ran the gamut from freezing experiments using prisoners to find an effective treatment for hypothermia, tests to determine the maximum altitude for parachuting out of a plane, injecting prisoners with malaria, typhus, tuberculosis, typhoid fever, yellow fever, and infectious hepatitis, exposing prisoners to phosgene um, and mustard gas, and mass sterilization experiments. The horrors being meted out against the American people can be traced back in a direct line to the horrors meted out in Nazi laboratories. In fact, following the Second World War, the U.S. government recruited many of Hitler's employees, adopted his protocols, embraced his mindset about law and order and experimentation, and implemented his tactics in incremental steps. Sounds far-fetched, you say? It's all documented. As historian Robert Gelatelli uh, recounts, the Nazi police state was initially so admired for its efficiency and order by the world powers of the day that Herbert Hoover, then head of the FBI, actually sent one of his right-hand men, Edward Patrick Coffey, to Berlin. In January 1938, at the invitation of Germany's secret police, the Gestapo, the FBI was so impressed with the Nazi regime that according to the New York Times, in the decades after World War II, the FBI, along with other government agencies, aggressively recruited at least a thousand Nazis, including some of Hitler's highest henchmen, all told thousands of Nazi collaborators, including the head of a Nazi concentration camp, among others, were given secret visas and brought to America by way of Project Project uh, Paperclip. Subsequently, they were hired on as spies, informants, and scientific advisors, and then camouflaged to ensure that their true identities and ties to Hitler's Holocaust machine would remain unknown. And all the while, thousands of Jewish refugees were refused entry visas to the U.S. on the grounds that it could threaten national security. Adding further insult to injury, American taxpayers have been paying to keep these ex-Nazis they're not ex-Nazis. Yeah, we've got a lot of Nazis here. On the U.S. government's payroll ever since, and in true Gestapo fashion, anyone who has dared to blow the whistle on the FBI's illicit Nazi ties has found himself spied upon, intimidated, harassed, and labeled a threat to national security, as if the government's covert 
taxpayer-funded employment of Nazis after World War II wasn't bad enough, U.S. government agencies, the FBI, CIA, and the military, have since fully embraced many of the Nazis' well-honed policing tactics and have used them repeatedly against American citizens. It's certainly easy to denounce the full frontal horrors carried out by the scientific and medical community within a despotic regime such as Nazi Germany. But what do you do when it's your own government that claims to be a champion of human rights, all the while allowing its agents to engage in the foulest basis and most despicable acts of torture, abuse, and experimentation. I had I had conversations not one, not two, there were several. Many of my friends were Jewish. We'd have dinner parties and talk about Germany and Oh, how could those Germans allow that to happen? We would never. It could never happen here. We would never allow that. We allowed it. Past tense, we allowed it. When all is said and done, this is not a government that has our best interests at heart. This is not a government that values us. Clearly, perhaps the answer lies in the third man, Carol Reed's influential 1949 film starring Joseph Cotton and Orson Welles. In the film, set in post-World War II, Vienna, rogue war profiteer Harry Lyme has come to view human carnage with a callous indifference, unconcerned that the diluted penicillin he has been trafficking underground has resulted in the torture deaths, tortured deaths of young children. Challenged by his old friend Holly Martins to consider the consequences of his actions, Lyme responds, in these days, old man, nobody thinks in terms of human beings. Governments don't, so why should we? Have you ever seen any of your victims, asked Martins, Victims, responds Limes, as he looks down from the top of a Ferris wheel onto a populace reduced to mere dots on the ground. Look down there. Tell me, would you really feel any pity if one of those dots stopped moving forever? If I offered you 20,000 pounds for every dot that stopped, would you really, old man, tell me to keep my money? Or would you calculate how many dots you could afford to spare? Free of income tax, old man, free of income tax. The only way you can save money nowadays. Yeah, most Americans, most Americans are uh, Harry Lyme. That's the truth we want to hide from ourselves. But we will never get anywhere. We will only continue to contribute to the spreading of evil until we face the horrifying truth of who we are as a people, collectively, who we are as individuals. As I make clear in my book, Battlefield America, The War on the American People, this is how the U.S. government sees us too, when it looks down upon us from its lofty perch. To the powers that be, the rest of us are insignificant specks, faceless dots on the ground. To the architects of the American police state, we are not worthy or vested with inherent rights. This is how the government 
can justify treating us like economic units to be bought and sold and traded or caged rats to be experimented upon and discarded when we've outgrown our usefulness. To those who call the shots in the halls of government, we the people are merely, merely the means to an end. We the people who think, who reason, who take a stand, who resist, who demand to be treated with dignity and care, who believe in freedom and justice for all, have become obsolete, undervalued citizens of a totalitarian state that, in the words of Rod Serling, has patterned itself after every dictator who has ever planted the ripping imprint of a boot on the pages of history since the beginning of time. It has refinements, technological advances, and a more sophisticated approach to the destruction of human freedom. We undervalue ourselves. We don't think too much of our own self. That's the only way that you can get a government to treat its citizens the way we are now being treated. Because no, no individual, no people would stand to be treated as we are treated if they thought highly of themselves if they respected themselves, if they were mature adults. So we allow this because we don't really care even about our own self. The obsolete man speaks to the dangers of a government that views people as expendable, twilight zone, the obsolete man, expendable once they have outgrown their usefulness to the state. Think about, think about that prosperity that grew wildly right after World War II. Americans putting on their suits, marching off to their corporate jobs. All the manufacturing, Americans having good, decent jobs with benefits and promises of pensions that once were fulfilled. They used us. They used us to create the wealth of this so-called great nation. Now, they don't need us. So they're putting us down like you do a dog. That's all. Here's the kicker. This is where the government, through its monstrous inhumanity, also becomes obsolete. As Serling noted in his original script, for the obsolete man, any state, any entity, any ideology which fails to recognize the worth, the dignity, the rights of man, that state is obsolete. How do you defeat a monster? You start by recognizing the monster for what it is. All links are below.